Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Arzu Osanlu, and my colleagues and I are coming to you from the University of Washington Simpson Center for the Humanities. We welcome you to this third installment of our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the global north. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. The speakers in our series consider the discursive processes through which entire regions of the world have been written out of the narrative of the origins an impulse to humanitarian care. Now we seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study of humanitarianism and emphasize instead experiences across the global south with a particular focus on South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa, regions which have been conceptually marked off from understandings of humanitarianism but which have hosted the bulk of the world's refugees since World War II. Across three thematic clusters, this fall it's been decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism. In the winter of 2021, it will be comparative humanitarianisms. And finally, in the spring, it will be rethinking the human. We will compare important conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices. And these comparisons will allow us to illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment constitute the objects of suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualify as worthy of that care. So I now will turn to my colleague, Kabiri Robinson for a few additional remarks. So our fall theme is decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism. This part of the Sawyer seminar focuses on the history of forced, of forced migrations within and across the global south. Through this focus on the global south, we aim to examine humanitarian practices that emerge in relation to, but not necessarily from, a Euro-American genealogy set within the politics of international asylum and refugee laws that first grew out of World War II. We believe that the work of decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarian humanitarianism requires two key intellectual moves. Now, the first is to reorient our perspective toward the primary spaces of care by focusing on forced migrants in the global south, the primary site for hosting, and on those host countries and communities' experiences and practices of hosting. The second is to move away from a primarily Euro-American intellectual history in order to consider the ideological underpinnings of caring for distant others outside of humanitarian frames. We envision that such comparative reorientations will, transfer, will transform our broader perspectives on humanitarian care to integrate diverse rationalities and the forms of expertise that underlie them. So today it is with tremendous pleasure that we welcome Jessica White and Emma Meyer to the series of public presentations and discussions in the humanitarianism series. Taken together, their talks prompt us to rethink the ethics and scope of international humanitarianism in the context of decolonization processes. In Professor White's talk, the concept of international humanitarianism as paradigmatically envisioned by figures such as Henry Dunant appear as a contested vision of international solidarity and one which moreover reflected the same Euro-Christian civilizational discourses that also legitimized imperial rule and colonial conquest. And in Dr. Meyer's talk, 
she describes how an alternative vision in the form of a regional aid in, of, in the form of regional aid practices and norms emerged at a moment of decolonization in the global south, partially in response to the deliberate refusal of the nascent international humanitarian order to recognize displacement in the global south as being like or producing the same kinds of problems as that experienced in Europe at the very same historical moment. It's a great pleasure now to turn to our colleague, uh, our colleague uh, Christian Capitescu, the postdoctoral fellow for the Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, who will be the moderator of the question and answer portion of this seminar. And I now also turn to him to introduce our speakers. And it is my pleasure to welcome our two invited speakers, Jessica White, Scientia Fellow and Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia and Emma Meyer, who completed her PhD in history at Emory University this year and comes to us from Seattle. Our first speaker is Jessica White, whose scholarship integrates pol political philosophy, intellectual history, and political economy to analyze contemporary forms of sovereignty, human rights, humanitarianism, and militarism. She is the author of Catastrophe and Redemption, the political thought of Giorgio Gambin, published in 2013, and The Morals of the Market, Human Rights, and the Rise of Neoliberalism, which appeared last year. Jessica also serves as an editor of Humanity, an international journal of human rights, humanitarianism, and development. Our second speaker, Emma Meyer, is currently revising her dissertation titled Resettling Burma's Displaced labor, rehabilitation, and citizenship in Vishakhapatman, India, 1937-1979. to Her research focuses on histories of first migration between India and Burma, Myanmar, in the mid-20th century, but tra by tracing the historical development of refuge making in modern South Asia. Emma's project investigates how Burmese displacees claimed rights and entitlements, exploring how their struggles to survive and live a meaningful life played an important role in shaping policies and practices of refuge. And now we bring to you Jessica White and Emma Meyer. Hi. My name is Jessica White. I'm really pleased to be here speaking with you today. I wish I were here in person. Instead, I'm speaking from Sydney, Australia, from the unceded land of the Wongol people of the Eora Nation. Today, I want to talk to you about anti-colonial challenges to international humanitarian law in the 1970s. This paper is called The Opposite of Humanity. It's a work in progress, so I'm really pleased to share it with you. In 1974, 700 delegates arrived in Geneva for the first session of the Diplomatic Conference on the Reaffirmation and Development of International Humanitarian Law Applicable in Armed Conflicts. This conference aimed to update the 1949 Geneva Conventions in the context of wars of decolonization. In his opening speech, the conference's president the Swiss diplomat Pierre Graber portrayed the slow evolution of international humanitarian law as an ever greater dissemination of the norms developed in the 1860s by the founders of the Red Cross. Referring to that organization's Swiss initiator, he rejoiced that the voice of that resolute visionary, Henri Dunant, was now heard in the remotest corners of the world. Noting that the 1949 Geneva Conventions had been developed by a limited number of European states, Graben nonetheless asserted that the scope of the conventions was universal from the first. The role of representatives from the remotest corners of the world, it appeared, was to testify to the incipient universalism of Dunant's humanitarian vision. As the first session of the diplomatic conference began, the United States continued to bombard Vietnam and violent wars of decolonization continued in Angola, Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau. Yet for many diplomats, these conflicts did not call for any fundamental transformation of humanitarianism. In addressing new forms of conflict, the representative of Geneva argued, the conference would continue the idealism of the most illustrious of their fellow citizens, Henri Dunant, 
The Director General of the United Nations Office in Geneva claimed that the fact that twice as many states were participating in this conference as had participated in the 1949 conference was proof of the permanence and the universal nature of the principles of a movement began by Henri Dunant over a century ago. As the conference got underway, however, Dunant's legacy was a topic of significant conflict. The original Geneva Conventions, which he pioneered, were signed in 86, 1864 by representatives of 12 European states. The dramatic expansion of participation in a legal process that ultimately led to the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions did not signal the consensual diffusion of that humanitarian vision across the globe. Instead, Dumont's name was mobilised in conflicts over the relations between humanitarianism and politics, between law and justice, and over the deep inequalities and hierarchies that marked the international order. The diplomatic conference has been depicted as the moment when the older laws of war, which privileged military necessity, were eclipsed by a new international humanitarian law, which privileged humanity and the protection of civilians. Here, I want to argue that there was little agreement about the stakes of mobilising humanity. For all their differences, delegates from the Global South came to the conference with two central priorities to characterise wars of national liberation as international rather than internal armed conflicts, and to secure privileged belligerent status, and so prisoner of war rights, for national liberation fighters. It was in opposition to such demands that Euro-Atlantic di diplomats mobilised Dunant's legacy to portray what they framed as the political arguments of anti-colonialists as a dangerous shift away from traditional humanitarianism. Much was at stake in the question of who would decide on the meaning of humanity. What was at stake in the debates for national liberation movements was not only the decolonization of humanitarianism, it was also whether humanity itself could be decolonized. In his 1956 commentaries on the fundamental principles of the Red Cross, Jean Pictet, who headed the ICRC's legal commission, described humanity as the prime mover of the whole movement. Pictet used humanity to signify both belonging to a shared species and a normative stance. The word humanity, he wrote, is used to describe a man who is good to his fellow human beings. For all the ICRC's claims to universality, its humanity always had borders. What Dan Edelstein writes of Enlightenment sentimentalism is equally true of the discourse of humanity. It always featured a villain. When the laws of humanity were inserted into the 1907 Hague regulations in the so-called Martin's Clause, humanity was explicitly paired with the usages established among civilised peoples. For Martin's, the Russian publicist who gave his name to this clause, Legal documents applied only to civilised countries, whereas those he called Muslim, pagan and savage peoples remained outside the international community, as did states such as Turkey, Persia, China and Japan. Humanity as a moral stance was no more universal. For Pictet, humanity as sentiment was closely related to Christian charity, compassion and pity. This was certainly true for Henri Dunant, whose life epitomised the convergence of Christianity with commerce and colonial violence. Today, Dunant's 1859 encounter with the battlefields of Solferino is famous as the event that prompted the foundation of the Red Cross. Less well known is that Dunant passed through Solferino on the way to seek the support of Napoleon III for his failing business investments in Algeria. In 1853, the young banker and evangelical left his desk in Geneva to help the Geneva Company of Colonists of Setif establish a private settlement on the best agricultural land around the Algerian market town of Setif. In a letter to the Emperor Napoleon III on behalf of the colonists, the French Secretary of State for War wrote, Sire, 
a company composed of Geneva owners and capitalists, offering the government the best guarantees of morality and solvency, seeks the concession of 20,000 hectares of land around Satif to found villages that would be populated by families originating in Switzerland. Seeking extra income, the emperor granted the colonists 25,000 hectares and the settlers went about expropriating land, cutting down forests and displacing local people in an attempt to transform agricultural practices along capitalist lines. Dunant was then granted a land package of his own, where he dreamed of developing an agricultural and industrial empire, a plan that failed after he was unable to secure another concession for more land and water to irrigate his colonizing dream. It was in a last ditch effort to secure this concession that he traveled to Lombardy, seeking a meeting with Napoleon III. It was ultimately this mission that propelled Dunant Solferino and into the history of humanitarianism. At Solferino, Dunant stressed the humanity of soldiers on both sides of the battle, noting that he made no distinction between nationalities and encouraged volunteer nurses to care equally for men on both sides. Such neutrality has since remained central to the Red Cross tradition. Yet the vision of universal humanity that underpins Dunant's commitment to treat the suffering without regard to national boundaries or political causes was itself highly particularist. Yet Algerians do appear in Dunant's memoir of the Battle of Solferino. In contrast to his praise for the generous and chivalrous French, he describes the Algerian sharpshooters on the French side as fighting with African rage and Muslim fanaticism, killing frantically and without quarter or mercy, like tigers that have tasted blood. Dunant also singled out Algerians as the worst culprits when it came to the treatment of the wounded. Despite all their leaders could do to keep their savagery within bounds, he wrote, they gave no quarter to wounded Austrian soldiers and men and charged the enemy ranks with beast-like roars and hideous cries. Dunant's commitment to humanizing warfare was indistinguishable from his view that aristocratic Christian Europeans should moderate the violence they committed against each other so as not to descend to the savagery typical of fanatical Muslims. By the opening of the Geneva Conference in 1974, the attempts by the major powers to uphold the traditional philosophy of the Red Cross had been compromised by the brutality of colonial conflicts. This philosophy seemed to gesture to a time before the great wave of decolonization and to an imperial conception of humanity that was apolitical, Eurocentric, and reliant on compassion for suffering victims. This conception of humanity had no place for the armed national liberation fighter. Furthering this impression, it was those who opposed granting privileged belligerent rights to national liberation fighters, who argued for what the UK delegate called an approach more in conformity with the work of Henri Dunant. The Delegate of Israel, for instance, opposed the participation of the Palestine Liberation Organization by arguing that the PLO had committed numerous acts of terror and so, I quote, had no place at a conference on humanitarian law. The Dutch delegate opposed what he framed as the political demand to grant international status to wars of national liberation by arguing that the conference's task was to legislate for the cause of humanity not of particular parties to particular conflicts. The implication of this traditional position were articulated most starkly by the delegate of the Philippines, who professed his delegation's willingness to abide by every agreement that was reached justly and validly and in the, aim of hum in the name of humanity. That standard, he contended, required that all matters be discussed objectively subordinating sentimental values of nationality, race, or religion. For this reason, he explained, no member of his delegation ever spoke of oppression or used such expressions as imperialist, alien occupation, or colonial rule, expressions which in his delegation's view had nothing to do with the development and reaffirmation of humanitarian law. 
From such a perspective, humanity required the bracketing of the divisive questions raised by wars of national liberation. Yet those who invoked Dunant and an apolitical humanitarianism did not have a monopoly on humanity. Representatives of national liberation movements also framed their opponents as inhumane. The PLO delegate, for instance, claimed that since the 1967 war, Israel, I quote, had been guilty of daily crimes against humanity in flagrant violation of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Delegates from the African National Congress and the Zimbabwe African People's Union stressed that apartheid was a crime against humanity. And the delegate of Sudan called for the conference to forbid what he called the horrifying crimes committed with impunity by the remaining colonialists, racists and Zionists. The least the international community could offer to the freedom fighters in Africa and Palestine, he argued, was to ensure that they were given humane treatment and that they enjoyed full protection under the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Were these mobilizations of humanity in defense of national liberation movements simply attempts to include such movements within the purview of a traditional principle of humanity? At first glance, certain comments give that impression. For following a narrow vote to exclude the People's Revolutionary Government of the sorry, the Provisional Revolutionary Government of the Republic of South Vietnam, the Viet Cong, from the conference, the Algerian delegate read a prepared Viet Cong statement that stressed that the concept of humanity and of the protection of all victims must be extended to cover all kinds of conflicts. The representative of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam also argued that the Viet Cong should participate in the name of all victims of the crimes against humanity perpetrated by American imperialism and so that it could serve the cause of humanity and thus spare future generations from still more inhumane massacres. Yet the Viet Cong supported by the Algerians and the delegates of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam also stressed the inadequacy of existing international law in the context of the war in Vietnam. According to the Viet Cong statement as read by the Algerian delegate, the 1949 Geneva Conventions were inadequate to new forms of warfare. The new lawmaking process must reflect the existing situation in which unarmed or ill-armed and underdeveloped peoples confronted an imperialist aggressor equipped with the most up-to-date and cruel weapons. This argument against the traditional concept of belligerency was made in more detail by Nguyen Van Hong, representing the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. In March 75, as North Vietnam waged Campaign 275 to take the Central Highlands, Nguyen spoke in favour of an amendment that would grant prisoner of war status to any captured members of liberation movements, regardless of whether or not they fulfilled the conditions outlined in the 1949 Geneva Conventions and carried arms openly, wore a distinguished distinguishing insignia and distinguish themselves from the civilian population. The concrete circumstances that the condition of visibility sought to regulate, Nguyen pointed out, simply didn't exist in Vietnam or in other wars of national liberation. The wars envisaged by the drafters of the earlier conventions, he argued, had three essential characteristics. They were fought between two industrial countries with relatively similar levels of military and economic development. The parties to the conflict could each retaliate on each other's territory. And the activities of militias or volunteer corps remained completely distinct from the life of the civilian population. These three characteristics of conventional war determined what he called the rationality of the condition of visibility. While Carl Schmitt had argued that as long as war retained a whiff of chivalry of dueling with pistols, the partisan could only be seen as an especially abhorrent criminal who stands outside the law, Nguyen pointed out that there was nothing of the whiff of the duel lingering over the villages and jungles of Vietnam. The rationality of a duel-like contest became decidedly irrational, he contended, when applied to a very different form of war. In Vietnam, he argued, ill-armed, an ill-armed and aggressed party 
was attacked by a party with far superior economic and military resources, who did not need to fear retaliation against its own civilian population. To demand that such unequal conflicts be governed by the rules established for equal war situations, he argued, would manifestly result in an injustice in the case of ill-armed and weak peoples who are attacked on their own territory. Against this unequal reciprocity, Nguyen argued that conflicts between profoundly unequal powers required a different set of rules that would allow the weaker party to mobilize its key advantage, its proximity to the people. In contrast to the image of the passive civilian that animated the advocacy of the Western states, Nguyen stressed that national liberation armies are inseparable from the civilian population. This, he told the conference, is the new law of the People's War. Nguyen Van Hong drew attention to the ways in which the language of humanity could serve the aims of imperialist violence. Contesting the argument that the spirit of humanity requires the national liberation fighter to distinguish himself from the civilian population, his fellow delegate argued that such visibility would only serve the counter guerrilla tactics of the imperialist aggressors. Transplanted from its original context, Nguyen contended that the humanitarianism of the major powers could only lead to violence and domination. It would be the opposite of humanity, he told the conference. The arrival of the Second World War in colonial Burma, present day Myanmar, in late 1941, led thousands of people of Indian descent who had settled in Burma prior to the war to evacuate. In December 1941, Japanese imperial forces bombed the colonial capital and took over the remainder of the colony in the following months, ending with the fall of northern Burma by May 1942. These attacks prompted millions of Burma's inhabitants to abandon their dwellings. While some migrated within the colony, others sought to leave Burma altogether and find refuge in neighboring territories. Approximately 600,000 people, the clear majority of whom were of Indian descent, set out westward toward the neighboring colony of British India, traveling by steamship, aircraft, or foot. Evacuees on the trek faced harsh conditions and ongoing skirmishes and air raids. They often lacked basic supplies such as food and potable water, leading to high death tolls. Though estimates of the number of people fleeing to India varied, roughly 500,000 evacuees survived the ordeal. Most would remain in India for the duration of the war. The timing and circumstances of the Burma evacuees' arrival in India necessitated a substantial response from the British Indian colonial administration. Many evacuees faced severe difficulties as they arrived in districts throughout India. Thousands had trouble generating enough income to support themselves. In addition, the rising costs of food, transportation, and other necessities caused by the war worsened their situation. Beginning in the middle of 1942, the colonial administration intervened, creating a new administrative apparatus and several initiatives meant to provide relief to Burma Indian evacuees. This relief edifice continued to function until February 1948, several months after India had won political independence in August 1947. Many Burma evacuees, often operating as members of evacuee associations, also took active roles in shaping relief during and after the war. Their calls for expanded aid programs, expressed through letters, petitions, and protests, sought monetary assistance, loans, employment, land, and a range of other concessions for evacuees. Though these demands for better treatment often went unheeded, they created a constant pressure for expanded forms of relief. Evacuees' efforts, therefore, helped demonstrate how displaced people, transitioning out of colonial subjecthood, sought to alter the face of relief while operating in provincial and local contexts. Today I will be focusing on interactions between Burma Indian evacuees from Vishakhapatnam district, 
and the late colonial and early post-colonial administrations of India during the transition period from 1945 to 1950. Specifically, I will examine arrangements made directly following the Second World War to return or repatriate evacuees to Burma. Though many evacuees ultimately were not able to return to Burma after the war, their letters, petitions, and telegrams illustrate how evacuees sought to remake their lives in a changed post-war era. In addition, these sources show how evacuees attempted to secure relief, recognition, and mobility even as they navigated their uncertain status in an era of decolonization. The histories of Burma Indian evacuees who sought refuge in India during the war and the treatment they received can also tell us much about the historical emergence of South Asia as one of the world's foremost hosting regions for displaced people. Literature on the development of refuge policies between the world wars and following the Second World War has largely focused on the international arena. It examines how international organizations, charitable associations, and related networks emerging during this period took on questions related to mass displacement. Much of this research has focused on the formation of the quote-unquote international refu refugee regime. As Christian Williams states, this emerging agenda quote, became the human rights framework for addressing mass displacement after decolonization and the enduring refugee problem across most of the post-colonial world, end quote. The problem with this model is that it posits a top-down or center-to-periphery process through which modes of managing displacement were normalized and universalized. My research challenges this model by emphasizing histories of migration, displacement, and refuge-making in a regional inter-Asian context focusing on regionally specific histories of refuge making helps to identify previously unrecognized actors and arenas in which decisions were taking shape about how to manage and treat displaced people. As this paper and my broader research demonstrate, displaced people in the late colonial and early post-colonial period took upon themselves active and important roles in shaping the terms of the resettlement. By shifting the focus to regional and local interactions, we can see that numerous organizations and individuals were debating these questions and finding their own solutions throughout the 1940s and 1950s, in the same period during which many of the most famous international laws and determinations about the proper treatment of displaced people were forming. Therefore, this paper contextualizes the evacuation of Burma and its aftermath revealing these events to be important transitional moments in the development of colonial era and early independence governmental policy toward displaced people. Almost since the moment of their arrival in India, many evacuees who had been separated from family members, along with those who had left behind businesses, jobs, and properties, sought confirmation from colonial authorities that they would be able to return to Burma after an Allied victory. However, it was only in December 1945 that the government of India arranged a distinct repatriation program for evacuees. The Indian administration required that all evacuees wishing to return to Burma register themselves and apply for evacuee identity certificates which would serve as proof of identity and as travel documents for evacuees. Each evacuee family was to fill and submit forms that would provide the colonial government with demographic information and details about their post-war plans. Despite these preparations to equip Burma Indian evacuees with travel documents, a large-scale return of the displaced never materialized. The war had wrought extens extensive damage in Burma, leading to post-war transportation, food, and accommodation shortages, and considerable destruction within Burma's infrastructure and industries. The war had taken a heavy toll, and repatriation programs stalled due to concerns that the large-scale return of evacuees would exacerbate difficult conditions in Burma.
Even without government support, however, many evacuees continued to attempt to cross the Bay of Bengal into the late 1940s. As the following section will explore, evacuees migrating regionally faced a number of challenges regarding their access to transportation networks, bureaucratic offices, and paperwork regimes from the late 1940s to the early 1950s. For instance, steamships that had frequented the northern Andhra coastline prior to the war no longer visited Vishakhapatnam and other smaller ports in the region. At the same time, Burmese diplomatic offices in Vishakhapatnam that had outfitted intending passengers with the correct paperwork closed due to a decline in traffic by 1950. Due to these changes, multiple small ports closed altogether, further limiting travel options for those hoping to reach Burma, as well as other destinations. Finally, during the same period, the evacuee identity certificate was discontinued as a valid travel document, replaced by other paperwork requirements. These discontinuations of the late 1940s and early 1950s did not occur without opposition and sustained campaigns to arose to either reverse these changes or to find alternative ways to allow evacuees to cross the Bay of Bengal. Letters and petitions on these matters provide insight into how those claiming evacuee status sought to keep hold of older patterns of movement by coming forward to local offices to sign their names or fix their thumbprints to letters and petitions, Burma Indian evacuees were laying claim to privileges that were theirs through tradition and seeking to produce connections of accountability and responsibility between the government and themselves. By October 1950, the Home Department of the Madras Provincial Government began receiving petitions and telegrams from groups of evacuees living in Vishakhapatnam. The petitioners characterized themselves in different ways, including, um, including as Burma evacuees of Vishakhapatnam district and also as poor people. They emphasized their long-standing connections to both India and Burma. In one letter, the quote, undersigned Burma evacuees of Vishakhapatnam district, end quote, wrote that they had been in the habit of frequently visiting Burma from the last 30 to 40 years. A separate letter, signed with the thumbprints and signatures of 23 individuals, claimed that its authors had permanent residence in Burma and owned properties and lands there as well. In those olden days before the war, the petitioners claimed that they had been forced to go to Burma due to crop failures, insufficient funds to support their families, or a lack of job opportunities available in India. Their long association with Burma had been temporarily ended during the war when the petitioners had fled, quote, to India by the land route through hills and forests, forests experiencing horrible troubles with a heavy loss of money and other valuables. The calamity of the evacuation had led to, quote, all of us becoming too poor to maintain our families in India. As we were entirely dependent on the business which we used to do in Burma, our financial position has become worse since we cannot get proper work to do in India, end quote. With the war's end, however, the Burma evacuee petitioners explained that their situation was one of continuing movement and migration in the much altered circumstances of the post-war era. After Burma's reoccupation by Allied forces, the petitioners wrote that they had resumed, quote, going to Burma, and we made several trips on the strength of the Burma evacuee identity certificates issued by the government of India. This travel was conducted freely and easily from Vishakhapatnam port, which was, as they referred to it, the convenient and nearest port to all our villages. By 1950, however, significant changes in transportation availability, access to bureaucratic offices, and paperwork requirements again threatened these migrants' connections to Burma. Letters sent by evacuees to Indian provincial and national administrations were riddled with references to the closure of Shakapatnam port for passenger traffic 
the fall in the number of steamship routes traveling between India and Burma, the relocation of the Burmese Vice Consul Office to Madras, and the closure of immigration offices at Vishakhapatnam. Additionally, the planned phasing out of the evacuee identity certificate, which was to go into effect by the end of 1950, was of specific interest to evacuees. The evacuee certificate was to be replaced with passports issued by the Indian Republic and entry visas issued by the Burmese Vice Consul. In addition, those intending to migrate would need a no objection certificate obtained from the protector of immigrants whose office had been shifted from Vishakhapatnam to Madras. Each of the letters concluded with the same three demands. Reopen the Vishakhapatnam Burmese Vice Consul Office, move the Protector of Immigrants Office from Madras to Vishakhapatnam, or prevent the office from closing altogether, and make arrangements to board the ship at Vishakhapatnam Harbor and order the shipping man managements to send their ships to, v to Vishakhapatnam. As evacuee petitions made clear, however, their appeals to provincial and national administrations in India were not only about improving ease of access to travel facilities, but also a matter of survival. Evacuees were claiming that they could not remain in India due to poor economic conditions there. One letter attested, quote, we are starving here for food and raiment as the crops failed this year due to no rain in some parts and due to excess of water in other parts. We are weakened financially due to the failure of crops. Another letter also pointed to crop failures, floods, and drought, saying that, quote, at present days, we with our families are actually starving in these districts. These harsh circumstances compounded the effects of the recent closures and the discontinuation of the evacuee identity certificate. As one letter explained, we beg to state our difficulties increased when the new system of obtaining Indian national passports has come into force. We are waiting since so many months to return to Burma. We have submitted our applications for passports nearly two months ago, and we have not received anything from the authorities concerned. Traveling to port cities, whether nearby Vishakhapatnam or the distant ports of Calcutta or Madras, to secure documentation and passage to Burma, presented substantial difficulties for the petitioners. Evacuees living in Vishakhapatnam and surrounding areas described Calcutta and Madras as big, unfamiliar cities. As one letter explained, Calcutta port is nearly 500 miles and Madras 500 miles, and also we do not know the languages of those ports, i.e. Tamil, etc. We, we are all Telugu people. The trip there and back and sometimes several trips, depending on the time taken to process paperwork, secure tickets, etc., would cost money, as would finding accommodation during their sojourn. If we go to Madras in these hard days, one letter concluded, that the result would be, quote, the greatest expenditures and having to be in the hot sun without shelters. The representations of Burma Indian evacuees shed light on a host of multiple interwoven rights and privileges that evacuees sought to claim. Their customary mobility across the Bay of Bengal, for instance, could not be continued without access to bureaucratic offices, documentation, and convenient modes of transportation. In turn, mobility was not a goal in itself. Evacuee petitioners tied it to their economic strength their ability to escape poverty or harsh circumstances, and whether or not they would be able to survive in times of misfortune. Burma Indian evacuees who came forward to local offices to sign their names or affix their thumbprints, actions which took place years after their displacement from Burma, provide an example of the diverse arenas in which displaced people sought to influence decision-making about their treatment. Thank you. In both talks, our, uh, our speakers present subjects of study that make active anti-colonial interventions into the conventional humanitarianism. Taken together, 
Both talks prompt us to rethink the ethics and the scope of international humanitarianism in the context of decolonization. Dr. Meyer, could you say a few words about what your study of Burmese displaces demands for relief and aid and uh, the larger body of your work uh, might mean for other scholars working in the global south where decolonization was co-historical with the uh, 1951 conventions. Was decolonization per se the process by which the inadequacy of international humanitarianism and its idea of humanity were exposed for the first time? And Professor White, could you talk about how the claims made in the 1970s by uh, leaders of decolonizing armed conf conflicts were anticipated by similar arguments in the 1950s and uh, by the kinds of grassroots demands for relief and aid described by Dr. Meyer in the South Asian context. Thank you. Emma, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so thank you for those questions. Um, I, I kind of heard two questions. The first one, you know, is, is about what does my research mean for other scholars working in the global south? Um, I think if there's anything that I hope people take from my research, it would be the importance of looking away from the international refugee regime and exploring these other arenas and circumstances in which, you know, humanitarian efforts were taking shape. Um, and I can give an example. So there was a letter that I was thinking of including when I was preparing this talk. And it was written in 1945 by a Burma Indian evacuee named S.M. John, who was a president of an evacuee association in Southern India. And it was a letter to the editor and it was pointing out basically that Burma evacuees had been in India by that point for over three years. Um, and he was saying that at that moment, the colonial government had put forward 80 million rupees to send abroad um, to help support the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRRA. And that sum was more than the colonial administration had spent on half a million evacuees over the course of the past three years. Uh, so he's pointing out that discrepancy, but also pointing to the fact that Burma Indian evacuees would not be receiving any assistance from UNRRA. Uh, so I think there's, there was clearly this awareness among certain circles of evacuees that there were these governing bodies, associations and networks that were forming internationally, um, but that despite the fact that, you know, evacuees were also displaced people uh, who were, you know, thrown out of their lives by the war, uh, you know, they were really beyond the purview of these, of, of these associations. So, uh, that was not only true for groups that I have studied, but for many people around the world. And so for me, that kind of poses the question, uh, what did displaced people who were outside of this international regime of protection and care end up doing? And I think by asking that question, you open the door to a lot of histories that actually run parallel to uh, and perhaps don't often intersect with the stories of international humanitarianism that many people are more familiar with. Um, and I think that those parallel or you could possibly call them peripheral histories are really essential for deepening our understanding of humanitarianism and also a range of other related terms like refuge and refugee relief, aid, care, rehabilitation, etc. Um, so the second question, as I, I think it's a, it's a good question and a big question, um, and so I don't want to sort of try to answer it uh, briefly, but you know, and maybe we can come back to this well, with other people's questions too. But when you talk about decolonization being the first time in which inadequacies of international humanitarianism were exposed, I think for me, it's an interesting question and it makes me sort of immediately ask like, what are we considering decolonization and where does decolonization begin? So are we talking about like formal political decolonization or are we, also including anti-colonial movements or you know where where does that process begin um, and I I suspect that really the inadequacies of international humanitarianism have always been evident to some uh, and and there have always been challenges to humanitarian aid, aid and action uh, and so I think you know but maybe that that 
challenge is not necessarily clear to us. And I think that's actually a call to historians and to other scholars to really reclaim those narratives. Thank you. Thanks. And I mean, in relation to the way that the arguments that I looked at were anticipated in the 1950s, I think that there are a number of ways. The first is that obviously there were significant wars of decolonization taking place in both the British and the French empires and many of the legal arguments as well as the political arguments that were developed in those contexts went on to influence the drafting of the additional protocols. So I think particularly of um, General Japp's writings in the context of the conflict with the French um, and also the work of Mao, which was really quite influential on many people during the drafting of the additional protocols in the 1970s. The question of the partisan was a question that was raised really strongly in that period. But then there was also a sort of a negative influence, which is if we look back to the 1949 Geneva Conventions, you see that the major colonial powers of the period were desperate to ensure that the questions of wars of decolonization didn't come into the sort of the remit of the drafting of the laws of war. So they were very concerned to ensure that what they characterized as internal struggles, internal to their own empires, would not be subject to any kind of interrogation or regulation by these legal frameworks. Um, but at the same time, you saw, particularly in the French case, that the influence of um, the experience of occupation and resistance meant that there were, for instance, resistance organisations within the French delegation during the 1949 Geneva Convention. And they were very concerned that resistance, popular resistance to occupation should actually be legitimised by this new convention. So they made a set of arguments that would later also be drawn on by anti-colonialists in the 1970s. And it was very interesting to note that certain international lawyers, particularly from the United States, who were very sympathetic to the arguments made by French resistance fighters in the late 40s for allowing civilians to act against foreign occupation were outraged when similar arguments were made in the context of national liberation movements in the 1970s. So there were some direct links between those two contexts and some of those people who were very influential both in fighting those wars and in theorizing them back in the mid 20th century, particularly figures like uh, Mohammed Bujawi and General Jap went on to exert a real influence in the process in the 1970s also. We're moving to our Q&A segment. And uh, our first question as part of this goes to both of you. So your two talks focus on the regional and provincial context where previously unrecognized actors are actively involved in decision-making in the humanitarian arena. How do your sources shape the arguments you made? So for instance, Jessica's perspective on peripheral powers pushes back against the globalizing and universalizing norm of international humanitarianism. And Emma shifts attention to the grassroots demands for aid and repatriation that had an effect on how displaced people and post-colonial na national citizens were managed at the local and state levels. Could you talk about how your sources give rise to a new understanding of the role of refugees and recipients of aid as agents of change? Sure, I think that's a good question. And I think that one of the things that strikes me that is common to both of our talks is an attempt to challenge and to push back against a sort of diffusionist narrative according to which norms are established in sort of international fora or in Europe or the Anglosphere and are then sort of diffused to the rest of the world. And it was this narrative that was really, really strong during the initial drafting of the additional protocols. So I was very interested in the way that all of these figures who mobilized the legacy of Henri Dunant did so explicitly in an attempt to say, look, the fundamental framework has already been established. Um, it's this wonderful humanitarian model that we are now so 
pleased to be able to apply to the rest of the world. So this quote about the remotest corners of the world, as if what were taking place was simply that Dunant's model was being diffused across the globe. But what was really important, particularly in reading all of the drafting debates that took place during the additional protocols, as well as reading the works of many of the, the lawyers and the diplomats who were involved um, from national liberation movements at the time in challenging these perspectives was that it became very clear that even when they used the same language, even when they mobilized ideas of humanity, that they weren't using the same concepts. And so one, it was very clear and the, the North Vietnamese gave the starkest examples of this, of an explicit challenge to a model of humanity that at one point um, Vietnamese delegates at the conference talked about as the sort of the fake humanity, which had explicitly been used to justify forms of population displacement, kinds of concentration of populations justified through the need to keep them out of the conflict. Um, so reading these sources and the actual, really interrogating the arguments that were made by representatives of both newly independent states and national liberation movements in that period, I think really helps us to understand that there were conflicting models of humanity, just as there were conflicting political priorities that were animating the debates at a conference like these ones. So I think that, you know, for me, adopting a regional approach is um, important because so many of the studies that you look at, um, they might talk about uh, countries acting or representatives of countries um, engaging in these in these kind of larger international level debates. And I think that is definitely a, a fruitful uh, level of observation and level of uh, inquiry. But for me, you know, many of the people whose, um, whose sources I'm, I'm finding, the, 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 these kind of sources that they're producing, they're not um, elite actors. They're not able to even necessarily be functioning on a, a national stage within their country. Um, so they're having to, much more of their interactions are with, um, you know, colonial officials or government, government officials, like within their district possibly, or within their uh, province or state. And, um, you know, they're also having to kind of adjust their claims in a, in a sense too. So especially whenever you're looking at the colonial period, um, there are certainly adjustments being made uh, in the sense that you're dealing with an intractable force. And, and, you know, 1942 is a period in which the colonial state has really recently jailed all of the Indian National Congress, basically. And, and um, it's, so I think that considering these like um, subnational regional contexts really brings out a lot of um, nuance and, and and real difference in terms of what what is being claimed and what is being uh, sort of thought of as the, the way to go forward. Uh, so I think that, that that only appears when you sort of zoom in. Thanks both. And from our audience comes the next question for Jessica. Although the new protocols of the Geneva Conventions included struggles for decolonization and national liberation as international conflicts and granted them POW status, these provisions have hardly been used since then in international law with relation to Palestine or South Africa, for example. What are possible explanations for this absence and have they been used in broader contexts? Thanks. That's a really good question and a really important one. Um, and yes, it's absolutely true. And one of the things that I think is really important about this context is that within the, the conference itself, the diplomatic conference, the production of the additional protocols and particularly the statement that international conflicts included self-determination struggles against um, alien occupation, racist regimes, et cetera, was an enormous victory for national liberation movements, for delegates of newly independent states. But this victory in the conference center didn't necessarily translate outside it. On the one hand, 
Um, many of the states concerned obviously refused to accept and to ratify the additional protocols. Israel has never accepted it. The United States played a significant role in the drafting, but under the Reagan administration, Reagan refused to send the additional protocols to the Senate, arguing quite explicitly that he would not uh, exchange progress in uh, international humanitarian law for giving rights to terrorists. So this framework of the terrorist was always very much present and became only stronger in the period after the formal adoption of these uh, protocols. I think there was also that the way that these clauses around international status were written were always in a sense self-limiting. So there was much debate over exactly the wording of how a national liberation struggle as an international armed conflict would be defined. And not only um, major European powers and colonial powers, but also many post-colonial, post-independent states also really wanted to restrict that criteria to make very clear that it didn't apply to self-determination movements of minorities within their own newly independent states. So that meant that there was this wording of that this would apply to self-determination movements against alien occupation, racist regimes, foreign domination. And both of the parts, or sorry, a people struggling for its self-determination against those criteria. And both parts of this were controversial. The question of who constituted a people was one that was a real source of conflict at the time and has continued to be a conflict, for instance, in the context of Palestine. Um, on the other hand, you also saw that this question of who constituted a racist regime or who was exercising alien domination was one that, as the Israeli delegates said at the time, no state was ever going to agree to characterize themselves in these terms. So the states that this was most designed to apply to, which were particularly Israel and South Africa, which were two of the main conflicts that were outstanding at that time, were never going to recognize this provision as applying to their own conflicts. And just finally, quickly, in terms of why this may have been that, um, this victory didn't translate into material usage of these provisions. I think that some of these figures, I think that the national liberation movements and anti-colonialists engaged in this process for different reasons. For the PLO, I think there was much, it was much more a question of diplomatic recognition than a belief that this would really impact on the conduct of armed conflict with Israel. But I think that for some figures and particularly for international lawyers, obviously figures like George Abi Saab, um, the Egyptian delegate who played an enormous role in developing some of these provisions, there was a sense, and for Bujawi also, there was a sense that victories in international legal bodies would actually transform the hierarchical international order. And I think that the discrepancy between the legal victory and the material absence of victory suggests that that faith in international law to actually transform entrenched power dynamics and hierarchies was perhaps misplaced. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Emma, the next question is for you, and it's a long one, so bear with me. The language used to refer to Burma's displaced people was evacuee, not refugee. On the one hand, this term seems to accept that Burmese displacees were not refugees. On the other hand, the term also raises issues of the recognition of displaced people as economically impacted subjects. Many of the current debates about humanitarianism show that access to aid and protection is often reserved for refugees that qualify as political subjects. How would our understanding of these modes of recognition change if we shifted the focus to examining refugees or aid regimes more broadly as concerned with humans as economic subjects? That's a great question. And I, uh, it's something that I, discuss more in my other research, but I think that, um, so, so on the one hand, uh, I use the term evacuees and that was the, the term most commonly used like in colonial sources, but um, interestingly, they were also referred to as refugees in colonial sources as well. 
Um, and, and sometimes in petitions, they would also use refugee or would use um, like in Telugu, uh, or like people who fled basically. Um, so I think that there was a, a sort of stretch between those terms um, and, and they, they were used interchangeably at different times. Um, so, so a major kind of way for, for my understanding of how uh, these evacuees were treated is the is I I intimately tied up with the fact that they were um, largely laboring people. So um, prior to the war, much of the migration between India and Burma was working people who would, um, you know, go and work in in the rice industry, go and work in. Um, in cities, for instance, in transportation, in uh, working in the dockyards, et cetera. Uh, so that background as labor, right, um, definitely affected how the colonial government of India treated them when they were displaced. Uh, it saw them as laborers and sought to kind of fit them within the um, colonial uh, e economy. Uh, and also, after the war, so they were perceived as, you know, excess labor and uh, the politics of the time in sort of uh, Burma, Myanmar, which was becoming independent, right, was that we don't necessarily want these laborers to come back. And so a lot of the, um, the difficulties with return was tied up not only with uh, sort of infrastructural issues, but also the, these political issues of, of um, maybe we'll accept some of them back to you know, uh, help with our rebuilding after the war, but many of them we're going to reject because uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily want them. So I think that the question that you're raising about you know, what kind of protections, what protections would look like if, if um, mobile displaced people were thought of as as um, economic figures, I think is a is really important, and it's um, it's one that has that that question has not gone away right from the 1940s until now. I think it's it's really essential, and so um, yeah, that's, I'll just stop there. But thank you for that question. Thanks so much. We have now time for one more question that is also incidentally very timely. And with an eye on the time, we ask for a very, very brief response from the two of you. So do you think that the white supremacist undertones within these inadequacies present in your research play out in the issues surrounding mass migration today? What lessons from this period can assist our analysis of present day migration patterns and related humanitarian responses? Um, I can, I mean, I, I think that if you, you know, look at migration patterns and um, you know I think many of us are currently in the United States so that might be a, a meat food right um, I think certainly these kind of racist uh, policies are still in effect whether it's having to do with um, which countries refugees are accepted from which countries migrants are accepted from um, you know, it's there. There are certainly uh, points of comparison and overlap, so I'll just limit myself to that. Yeah, and just to, I mean, I agree with that, but I think also what my research just highlights is the extent to which questions of mass migration are bound up with questions of armed conflict. That's really starkly obvious today. And it's also very obvious that these armed conflicts in many cases are taking place in civilian areas um, and in cities. And that the sort of the myth of humanity, which underpins, say, Henri Dunant's work, which underpinned the practice of states in the 19th century, was this dual like conflict in which supposedly war would take place between civilized men um, separate from the context of the civilian population. And I think that what we see is that that is almost entirely broken down and the need for new ways to think about armed conflict um, and also the, the displacement that armed conflict produces are really striking today. All right, and I'm now turning over to Arzu again. 
Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Um, we would love to thank Professor Jessica White and Dr. Emma Meyer. We also would like to thank our amazing support at the Simpson Center, particularly Caitlin Palo. And we'd like to thank all of you who are tuning in with us and for your continued interest. We look forward to continuing this series with you into the new year when we turn our attention to the second theme of the, uh, of the series, comparative humanitarianisms. Our inaugural event features Elena Fedayan Rasmia, Professor of Migration and Refugee Studies at University College London. She will launch our investigations with a talk on humanitarian responses to displacement from the Global South. So really a continuation of this very conversation. On behalf of all the organizers, we wish everyone a good evening, a restful holiday, and a happy new year. Good evening. <laughs>